One of my other biggest fashion influences, Yoji Yamamoto, his advice for younger designers, basically copy, copy, copy. You know, copy, mm. copy, copy, and at the end of the copy, you find yourself. If you're a true creative and you try copying something, you still, your touch is still gonna be on it. If you ask some people to make a copy of the same thing, they're all gonna be a little bit different. You, you can't even take yourself out of your work, even if you try sometimes. I mean, it's not a nice story, I don't want yeah. to too much. Oh, damn, it's fun. But it's already recording, and... and... That's fine. Okay, cool. So, what is your name and what do you do? Uh, my name's Melissa Taylor. I'm a fashion designer here in Dallas. Awesome. And uh, what kind of fashion do you make? I make men's and women's wear, kind of dark, romantic, wearable pieces. Like, I mean, this shirt I'm wearing here. So, a lot of tailored pieces, some trousers, but also some more ethereal type pieces. Yeah, and I know uh, from your last runway show, a lot of the looks, there was absolutely insane. Like, it was called Ghosts, right? Yes. And, um, like, which, I mean, and of itself very ethereal yeah and just like the flow and the silhouettes and everything were just like absolutely beautiful thank you so like, much. it was almost like just i guess the way i would imagine like clouds kind of flow through the air with wind and stuff yeah that's perfect that's what i was what i was going for is something very kind of smoky mm -hmm. you know so where where it feels yes like it's floating and transparent translucent you know yeah yeah and so what i guess inspired all of that so that collection was inspired by using ghosts as kind of a slightly cheeky metaphor for, for loss, for things people carry with them. Not just loss, but even you know, anything that someone might be haunted by. So sometimes it's regrets or you know, things that have happened to you that you know, are invisible, but shape who you are and kind of shape your actions and your thoughts. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So. Was there like a specific thing that inspired all of that? Or was it just a general kind of concept that just came to you? It was a concept that I'd, I'd thought about for a good while, just from times previous in my life where I've, you know, lost people that were close to me. I'm sorry. Or, it's, it's, thank you. Or even places that I used to, places that I used to live, you know, sense of home. I, I'm partly it's my personality to be, I think, a little bit nostalgic. And I didn't want to make a collection that felt nostalgic, but just having that sense, you know, that kind of romantic sadness, if you will. Mm -hmm. But 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 not looking at it just in that kind of like, you know, a sense of, of losing people or relationships, but but just the hauntedness of like, you know, things that can be hard to shake about your life that have just shaped how you interact with the world, like what you expect of the world and, you know, kind of your baggage that you can carry and how that is an invi invisible factor that continues to shape like what we do in the present and the future. So yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it <laughs> it's not super specific, but you know. No, I mean, and that's beautiful. And so you mentioned previous places and stuff that you lived in stuff and like the idea of home and stuff. So, yeah. and as we we're just chatting a little bit right before shooting, you said you were born in Fairfax, Virginia. Well, I, I grew up there until I, I was 14. So that's my home base, if you will, in the United States. I was born in Denver, but then okay. when I was 14, we moved to Ukraine. My parents sent our family to Ukraine. So I spent high school overseas. And that's kind of a strange like black hole of my like growing up years that I don't really have any any current ties to and like I don't have a way to get back, especially now, obviously with the, things how they are in Ukraine. Yeah. But yeah, I lived in Kyiv for four years and that was a weird time because, you know, I felt, you know, we were foreigners there. Uh, I felt like I lost my sense of home, but at the same time, like I'm still at, at an age where my sense of home is still being established. And so part of that does happen, you know, in Kiev. And then, you know, leaving to go back to the States for college, it's kind of a home place that you can never return to, you know, because people I knew there also were a lot of, you know, foreigners. So they are not gonna, you know, it's not like going back to your old neighborhood or you might have some of the same friends from high school or something like they're just dispersed everywhere. Yeah. And Ukraine itself is under, you know, literal attack and it's just not a place that really can be traveled to exactly at this point. So it's been a long time and kind of like, you know, the grief of, of losing somewhere that's like part of your roots, I guess. So yeah, that's part of where I'm from. And then I went to college in Indiana, came down to Austin, spent quite a few years there and then moved to Dallas a few years ago. Oh wow, okay. Yeah. So. It's a lot. Yeah, no, but I think it explains though a lot more, I guess, about yeah. like your most the recent collection. <laughs> so, like, yeah. Right now being in Dallas after how many years so? Like I think I've been in Dallas for almost five years at this point. Okay. Five years. 
So do you feel like after being here for five years, does it actually feel like home home to you or does it still kind of just feel like a place where you're existing? It's kind of both. I mean, part of the, the weird thing about growing up in, in the way that I did, which I think a lot of people who moved around can, can relate to it. Like, you know, you, it's hard to have a very established sense of home ever, but you also become like pretty flexible to where it's, it's easy to kind of assimilate to a certain degree and, and feel more or less at home. So yeah, I, I would say I feel at home in Dallas. Um, it's hard to imagine committing to being in a place like for life, which, you know, uh, and I recently was trying to move to New York and just, and, and even more recently kind of realized I need to stay put for the time being. Um, so I don't know, but yeah, I mean, I do love Dallas though. I, and I feel, I feel a sense of purpose here to a degree and I sense of homeness to a degree. Yeah. No, no, no. Do you ever feel like you felt like you had a home though at any point where that's a good question. I mean, probably before we moved to Ukraine, like I lived so in Fairfax probably. from the age of two to 14. So yeah, that was definitely classic home base. And my family's like a good family, pretty loving and mm -hmm. very loving and pretty normal. So, you know, normal sense of home for that part of my life. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. But not like throughout adulthood then? Probably not because I don't think I ever... I mean, I, I've learned to feel a sense of home, but I feel that more in my relationships that I'm close to. So, you know, the people who are my best friends, the people that are constants in my life, they kind of become what feels like home to me more than anything else, which I think that's, that's what home is, is kind of, it's your place where you have your core relationships. You know, it's not just the location. So for me, that's just kind of been more transient and, and I don't think of it so much as a place as, you know, the people that I'm very close to, which I have a handful of, yeah. Yeah. No, and I mean, I relate to that. Born in Houston, grew up in Austin, now living in Dallas and stuff like that. And I'm like, I even like throughout then, I would like move here and there. Yeah. So was never really like established, established in a place. Still have never felt like I had a home home, but. Interesting. Physically speaking, but then with people, you know, friends, that's where like, I definitely get most of my support and stuff. And that's where I feel most comfortable, right? But then. Sure. I've been going through that whole phase where a lot of people have been moving, you know, getting married yeah. and stuff, having kids. Yeah. They move on to a different place in life even. Yeah. So even if they're still physically here, mm -hmm. they're no longer, you know, in yeah, totally. life anymore. Totally. That, that's a weird thing that happens. Like as you become an adult, it's just some people really, really settle down and kind of disappear. And, you know, I'm, I'm in my late thirties and a lot of my friends are actually in their like, you know, mid to late twenties or early thirties, just cause like, a lot of those people haven't done that settling out yet. And a lot of people my age kind of just disappear. And I'm like, yo, I'm still out here hustling as a creative. And like, yeah. you know, so yeah, people do do that. It's weird. And then they feel like they're lost a little bit. Yeah, I guess, what does that feel like, I guess for you, with the whole idea about loss and everything, considering like, it's like you're losing people in your life, but not really at the same time. Yeah, I mean, that's a weird thing that I think everyone experiences to some degree, like, Sometimes it happens gradually to where it's not as painful, you know, like when when you grow out of friendships or, you know, classic example of good friends getting into a relationship, get married, children, whatever, you know, they just kind of slowly become less and less available and you kind of slowly have to find ways to fill in that space in your life. I mean, it's definitely more like kind of a violent loss when you go through like a breakup or you have like a friend pass away suddenly things like that or move away abruptly. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't know which I prefer cause it kind of, it's kind of sad in a different way when you lose people gradually, you know, it's just kind of like a strange thing. You know, why is it that you could be so close to someone and then just over time, like you just don't really connect the same way. It's kind of strange, but it's also, yeah, I really hate the other way, probably worse where it's <laughs> dramatic. No one likes that. Yeah, no, I, I don't know, because they both just suck in different ways. Yeah. But, I mean, it's all part of life, right? It's and all part of life. I think one can give you more baggage. The abrupt can give you a little more damage, maybe. Yeah, I That's agree. I feel. No, yeah. 100%. But I guess, so going back again, at what point did you just start getting interested in fashion? I mean, for, I, I don't, there was never a start. Like, it just was always, it was probably always there. Like, some of the earliest things I remember about childhood, like, Wow. I remember I really loved the movie Cinderella, which I tried to rewatch that recently and it's awful. Oh, really? Yeah. 
Um, but I loved that movie, and I remember distinctly watching, you know, the scene of Cinderella dancing in a ball gown. And I guess I was in my pajamas because my mom came in to bring me, like, an outfit to put on. And it was, like, just a pair of overalls. And I, 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 get through, I think I threw a little bit of a fit because, oh like, I just was, like, I can't wear overalls. Like, I want to wear a gown, like, yeah. you know. And, like, um, yeah, I always was into, like, you know, fancy dresses and ball gowns. Which is, it's kind of interesting because I don't dress very, like, foo-foo anymore. Like, I'm wearing very, like, I wear a lot of, like, much more what you might call menswear-inspired mm-hmm. pieces. More than a sex. Yeah, or androgynous. androgynous for sure. I love the term androgynous. Same. Yeah. I love to try to yeah. dress a little bit more. I love your necklace, by the way. Oh, thank yeah. You. Um, so, yeah, but nonetheless, I think that sense of glamour and romanticism certainly has still informed how I design now. And even like, you know, even this shirt, there's, you know, even the material I use is like a thick, like luxurious silk. Mm. It has a little sheen, it has an elegance to it. It's flowy, a it has bit flowy. it's a little bit ethereal. So all of those, you know, little Cinderella factors find their way in even to my menswear and even my, the more, you know, aggressive, brutalistic kind of shapes that I use. So it's kind of bringing the, together those, that's always in my work, you know, this, I don't like to call them opposing or opposite things, but, you know, kind of like bre- reaching this very wide spectrum of influences. Yeah, so actually it's interesting you brought List, like style and stuff do you feel like that was at all inspired from your time in ukraine yes absolutely that's a really smart question yeah i mean absolutely it was like the there's some very interesting architecture for sure in in kiev and all over eastern europe and i remember when i first moved to kiev i thought it was like super like it felt like a foreign planet to me it felt mm-hmm. so weird like i had never seen or experienced anything like it it was just very disorienting and like I found a lot, it, it was the middle of winter, so it felt kind of ugly to me because everything was dark and just pretty dreary. But I started to slowly like kind of appreciate some of the kind of buildings that I saw. And yeah, there's just some pretty incredible like constructivist, you know, Soviet constructivist era apartment buildings and definitely like a lot of brutalist, you know, architecture and sculpture and things like that. And I started to really love it. It's kind of weird when you, you know, living in the, you know, the ex-Soviet Union, there's still a lot of, like, kind of Soviet-era aesthetic things in the city that I lived in. And, you know, you grew up as an American, it's like, in the Soviet Union. Oh, yeah. And, but, but I was like, well, there's some pretty cool things from that era, you know. It's not any commentary on the, the, on the politics, but, you know, there's some pretty cool, yes, aesthetic influences from that as well. And I definitely got that from living in Kiev, for mm. sure. Yeah. So... I guess what things in particular about like the brutalistic architecture do you like? Like what were you kind of drawn to? I, and you like how I kind of chose. I know. I, I was like, like well, choice. yes, actually it's interesting because, you know, they have like very simple, like very heavy, very clean shapes with like these pristine lines that are very oppressive. But a lot of those buildings are made of, out of concrete mm-hmm. like this. And so you get like really beautiful, very subtle textures on the surface, you know, because all that stuff is older, like the Soviet, you know, the era that I specifically really love in brutalist architecture starts, you know, as early as like the late teens, early 20s, mm. you know, that all leads into like the, you know, mid-century classic modernist kind of stuff. But I mean, some of it started very, very early. But yeah, concrete, like you get this this worn texture that's very organic and honestly very soft. And even the way that, I don't know if you can see the top, but the way that the stains form with the top and just kind of trickle down is one of my favorite features, you know, on these extremely geometric, you know, mathematical shapes. And I think, I mean, honestly, that in a nutshell, at least the parts of it that I think about, encompasses something I'm always after in my, in my work is like these, you know, these clean, heavy lines that are just kind of awe-inspiring with, but, but at the same time, like there's this, very soft nature to it. There's something that very, the, the like degradation, like the sense of decay, you know? So you have this, so it's, a, it's kind of a haunting aesthetic. And I also like, you know, in, in Kiev especially, there's a lot of buildings that have a lot of like these big windows, big paint windows. So at night and in the evening, these big giant concrete or very heavy structures just like are all lit up with you know slightly different tones of you know blue and yellow and orange light through these you know crystalline windows and so kind of I think the contrast of that like very warm radiating interior in these concrete forms is like another thing I really love yeah so that contrast yeah that contrast is just like there's kind of a very 
it's, it feels otherworldly to me, you know, didn't grow up from my early years in that environment. It's just, yeah, it's otherworldly. Yeah. And all the heavy juxtapositions I just had between yeah. like it being like very cold and hard and yeah, very soft and organic looking at the same yeah. time. And then even something that I kind of noticed with the lab work is like uh, with a lot of the materials and colors and stuff like that you choose and even the weave patterns, it reflects and shows light kind of like how concrete or other like these, I guess, harsher materials kind of show light where it doesn't like fully absorb it, but it also doesn't fully reflect it. So yeah. It's almost like a soft glow. That's interesting you say that because, yeah, I mean, the, the materials I use, I'm always looking for, for materials whose surface does kind of have a little bit of that same feel. So I, I had no idea that translated that well, but glad to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I guess then at what point though, since, I mean, you're always in a fashion, but at what point were you like, I want to like do this. Yeah. Like this is like my gotcha. calling. So before I, when I was in high school, I was like trying to figure out, I don't know what to study. And I definitely considered fashion design, but for some reason I ended up, I, I always did a lot of, like I did, I was in art class. So I, I considered myself an artist, you know, as a high schooler and for some reason, I ended up studying, like going more the studio art, the fine arts route for college. And I studied, briefly studied glass blowing. Oh. I was gonna focus on that, which is, I don't know why. But the, the, the interest I think in, in light and forms and functionality, that was like part of the draw for me. And that still like is what I, I like about clothing as well. But I don't know, I, I loved to draw and after one one or two semesters of glass, I was like, okay, this is the career that this leads to, and it's really difficult. I'm not, I'm not interested enough to only do glass blowing. Like it's really limiting. I'm not really getting satisfied with like the conceptual aspect because there are conceptual glass artists, but I like to make the functional stuff, just like basically very utilitarian things. And I was like, I don't know, that's it's not a format I want to be conceptual in. And there's a part of me that really wants to make conceptual work something that is like more personal to me and more expressive in a personal way. So I kind of bounced around a little bit, you know, with ceramics and, which can also be very functional, but I did like, like not porcelain, but I did dolls, like ceramic dolls, which kind of has a, you know, a little element of like self-portraiture and, and expression that having to do with like the, the physical body. And then I did, my senior year, I did like uh, bookmaking and doll making. And the books were, you know, hand-bound books I love books, like the form of a book. And I just filled them with my photography and some like mixed media, painting, drawing, stitching, writing. But at the end of that, I was like, you know, I, I was trying to pay attention to what really made me feel like very alert and excited because I had trouble focusing on one at like, you know, one medium. And I was like, if I don't, if I'm not able to focus, I'm not gonna really be able to master anything and really be successful at it. So I was like, I've gotta figure out what I'm doing and really lean into it. And just by paying attention to what made me feel really excited, like I just started noticing very quickly, like just finding a really good piece of clothing. It just came back to clothing. I'm like, look, nothing makes me as excited as like, as fashion. And I avoided it because I felt like the fashion industry was very, like extremely toxic, which it is. And I felt if I went to art school or to fashion school that I would probably start feeling bad about myself. And I was a little bit afraid of like, especially, you know, in the early 2000s when I went to call it, or, or it, later 2000s when I went to college, like there's still like a lot of that heroin chic influence where there's a lot of, it's, that's not gone, but like, you know, I was like, you know, I already have a, a sketchy relationship with my body and that environment's probably gonna be very unhealthy for me. So I just like, it's not worth it. But I came back to the fact that like, I love fashion design more than anything creatively. And I was like, fuck it. Like, I, I guess this is what I'm doing. Um, and I can give up everything else and be happy giving up every other art form and just doing clothing for the rest of my life. I was like, yeah, so I'm gonna deal. So after college, I took some classes here and there, did a lot of self-study, studied with a, a tailor from Savile Row more recently, a couple of summers ago. Well, that was kind of like the accumulation of my, of my self-training, I guess. We did Zoom lessons. Lee Marsh is his aim, he's a Savile Row tailor based in London. And you know, that was kind of the tail end of the pandemic when I was able to do that and just have slowly learned how to make, you know, high-end clothing that is both functional and conceptual. You know, it feels very personal to me, but it's also very useful. So, yeah, long-winded story there for you. Yeah, no, that was amazing though. And like, I, I kind of love that you looked around a lot and experimented with 
all sorts of media and mm -hmm. I think it's interesting that you were kind of drawn to glass blowing and then mm -hmm. uh, pottery and stuff like that which are all very like organic flowy type shaping yeah. uh, methods mm -hmm. and the like even making books and stuff you know with like I don't know like the I don't know how to describe it, but it's just like very natural feeling, I guess, you know, to feel like paper and stuff and like binding yeah. and all of those things. Almost like taking natural raw elements and constructing it into different shapes and forms, which yeah. literally is like what kind of clothing yeah. is. Yeah. I, so did you have any, I guess, like major inspirations though, when it came to your art and then also with your fashion design stuff? I mean... In college, they always like kind of encourage us to find artists that we look up to. As far as fashion, you know, the, the first fashion designer that I was aware of, and I was only aware of, of this designer because I saw an image of their work that just like, you know, shook me to my core. It was Alexander McQueen, and there's this image of um, Devin Aoki, or AOT, wearing this kind of high necked pink, hot pink brocade sleeveless dress with like, you know, like a safety pin through her forehead. And it's a really iconic image, so a lot of people recognize it. But I was like, I'd never seen anything like it. I was just shook, like, and I came across the image a long time later and realized there was like Alexander McQueen. I, by then I already knew who he was in his work and I was just like a big fan. Um, but I always try not to look, I actually like really early on in my, in my career, uh, found found a real strong aversion to looking too closely at other artists' work that I really like mm. um, because I I don't know if it's healthy or not, but I just was afraid that I would um, inadvertently um, be too influenced by them and just be trying to make remake what they do, and I, I just didn't want to have those ideas too firmly in my head. So, I mean, I, I think that might have been counterproductive, but I just, yeah, I was just afraid of being like a second rate or second or third or fourth or fifth rate version of Alexander McQueen, you know, for instance, or whatever. But eventually I realized, you know, you've got a responsibility as a designer to be aware of what, you know, what the history of it is and the context that you're in. At the same time, I think it's important to draw your influence, you know, not by what you see of people doing at the same time necessarily. Because if, if you're a good designer, a good artist, you probably are already kind of plugged into the subconscious mind. And, you know, you're going to re react to things in a similar way to some other people anyways. And, and sometimes you end up coming up with things that feel eerily similar to other people's work that you're not even aware of. But I mean, it's just, there's so many things to pull your, for me, it's always, uh, it's more from my personal experience or if I want like a really an aesthetic influence, you know, besides the architecture or like obvious things I see in nature organically or, or, or whatever, film is always a big one for me, just of a medium that is visual and it can be like a, you know, a transport of experience that kind of makes you feel in a different world or is different era or you know different country whatever where things are just look a little bit different than regular life and you can get and draw inspiration from that so i try not to i still honestly still trying to look too much at other fashion designers like i kind of like keep a little like side eye on it basically because i still like I, Honestly, it makes me feel bad about myself a lot. I'm just like, God, I can I can never do that. Or like, you know, I don't have the resources or, you know, it just gives me all these negative thoughts and that's maybe a personality flaw, but that's that's how I work. But at the same time, one of my other biggest fashion influences is Yoji Yamamoto. Like, mm. I, <laughs> yeah, yes. I mean, he is probably my, my role model as far as like, you know, the personality and mindset that he has as a designer. I'm not always the biggest fan of all his clothes, but I don't care, like I, I love him so much. But he had a really interesting quote that was kind of his advice for younger designers. And part of it was like, you know, basically copy, 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 you know, copy, mm. copy, copy. And at the end of the copy, you find yourself was what he said. I was like, okay, well, if, if that's good enough for Yoji, it's good enough for me. So, you know, I think that's probably when I started leaning a bit more into like, you know, really looking at the techniques that the people are doing, you know, learning hardcore tailoring and not being as afraid to see what other people are doing, you know, that I, that I look up to and Honestly, if you're a true creative and you try copying something, you still your touch is still going to be on it. If you ask some people to make a copy of the same thing, they're all going to be a little bit different. You, you can't even take yourself out of your work, even if you try sometimes. So, yeah, that's kind of where my, my mindset now. But at the same time, I'm just like, you know, sometimes it makes me feel imposter syndrome. So I just, yeah, I keep that, 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 sight, that slight gaze on it just like this. But Yeah, and I mean, that could be hard because especially with like, the whole idea of being creative and you're like 
I have to be as original. It has to be me, you know, all of these things. It could be really difficult just because, I mean, there's like billions of us on this earth, right? So we're mm-hmm. gonna have pretty similar ideas and stuff. Exactly, like that. they're gonna be. But then at the same time, wanting to differentiate yourself. Yeah. And, and like be your own artist instead of, as you said, being like a fourth, fifth rate version of somebody else. Right. And it's not even productive to think about that stuff. I think at this point, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not worrying about being unique at this point. Cause on the one hand, it's kind of impossible, but paradoxically, it's almost impossible not to be. I just, I don't even worry about that question. It's just more like, I'm trying to lean more into like understanding what I want to make, what I like, you know, whether or not I think what I make is good. Is it reflecting, you know, like the feeling that I want, is it, is, you know, does it fit right? Does it cut good? Like, you know, do I want to wear it? Whatever. Just don't, just worry about, that's more than enough to worry about. That's all I need to worry about. Yeah. Then yeah. I think like when you're really just focusing on what you like in particular and stuff like that, what you want to do, even if you're getting a lot of inspiration from other things or like, oh, I love this, it still really shines through in your work. Because like when I look at your stuff, it definitely looks like your own. Like, of course, maybe it reminds me of other people's stuff. Yeah. And that's not a bad thing. Yeah. You know, it's okay. Yeah, but it's literally, it's not like it's an exact copy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Before the camera cut out and all that, you had mentioned that when it comes to your clothes, you don't necessarily focus a lot on, I guess, the whole gender expression portion of it, or like have it being strictly like men or women's wear. Uh, If you want to just dive a little bit more into that, what does, I guess, gender expression with fashion kind of mean to you? Gender expression with fashion, I mean, it's pretty personal. I, uh, yeah, gender expression with fashion it just kind of has. It's very open-ended um, from my perspective. So you know, I, when I when people ask me what kind of clothing I design, I I say men's and women's wear, just because for lack of a better term, you could say androgynous. But the thing is, like, I feel like the things I make, it can run the spectrum from things that are more traditionally feminine or masculine or whatever falls into those categories. But I don't really have, there's no really hard line between it. Like this shirt was from my menswear part of my collection or whatever. It just, I don't care who wears what in my, in my collection. I feel like there's certain things like certain body proportions that, you know, that you have to consider in the realm of different body shapes and all. But yeah, it doesn't matter to me at all how people mix up the pieces that I, that I make to express whatever they want to about their, their gender, you know. I don't care. Um, and it can just look a million different ways. So I do, obviously, like, the history of clothing is is pretty polarized. And I pull from wherever I want to in that. And, you know, women's wear has reflected, or has used men's wear as an influence for quite a long time. And only more recently, I think we're seeing more men's wear designers that pull from very traditionally feminine things. Like, Lomos Spain is, is one of the first designers I saw that really did that in an, an extreme way I hadn't seen before. I thought it pulled it off really well. So yeah, you you know, there's certain things that are probably more mass marketable, certain ways of defining gender and who clothing is for, but I don't really worry about that. And yeah, people do whatever they want to. Yeah. That makes sense. No, it does. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's a cool way of looking at it because for me, like also I, I grew up obviously in Texas my whole life, you know, they're in Yeehaw, yeah. they're in all white. Yeah, we are in Texas, so. Yeah. yeah. And so it's always been very traditionally just like, if you're a man, you got to dress like a man. Yeah. And so Weird. especially, you know, yeah. like that. I know. <laughs> Piercings. Yeah. Pearls. Yeah. Pearls. Yeah. And like, especially because uh, I grew up with like immigrant parents, right? Yeah. And so not only were they conservative just being here in Texas, but also bringing traditional values over from China as well. That, yeah. Uh, which is significantly less, I guess, progressive in a lot of ways as well. Mm. And so because of that, even though like I've always naturally had a personal taste for a little bit more, I guess, androgynous wear, mm. or even some cuts or styles are a little bit more feminine, can never like, you know, dress like that because parents growing up and all of that. Yeah. And so, and then also trying to fit into my environment as well, because I think uh, something interesting, someone just said recently uh, was part of having good taste and style and fashion isn't just like knowing like what things look specifically good by itself or what items or what outfits in of itself are good, but it's also uh, understanding the outfits in whatever context it is. Yeah. Right. So you want to go to a wild EDM rager party while wearing a full tux, right? 
but then you also wouldn't go to like a fancy bougie dinner out while wearing like a speedo yeah. so it's like i mean you could but you could wear a tux to an EDM party that would be kind of sick <laughs> no it would be but it's just yeah. i guess but in general though right um, yeah. so for me like always having to keep the context of the fact of where i live which is you know texas yeah ye to the hall right yeah. even though it can be progressive in some areas mm -hmm. uh but there's certain styles and things that just make more sense right so if i dress very uh streets of milan or like very like just new yorker right yeah it i would stick out a lot here which yeah. in of itself isn't a bad thing right uh in some ways but uh i like to kind of take that inspiration and pull it back and like be like how can i incorporate like texas taste or style so that's why a lot of my clothes ends up being like slightly southern inspired even though you know you don't have you know, other i i get that it's yeah. a little yeah. western shirt <laughs> yeah yeah and then i don't know just i don't know about like what i'm wearing right now I, if it's a good example or not but just that and then a little bit more of the feminine aspects and of cuts and stuff too right and like i don't like shorter shorts or like flowy tops or like jewelry yeah. even all of these things yeah uh, i think you know that is interesting that hearing you talk about this makes me realize you know also i did grow up in a very conservative situation like my parents were missionaries my dad was a oh, pastor wow. yeah so and i also understand you know living in in ukraine like you know being kind of an outsider and trying not well my parents didn't want to like stand out too much i was like i don't give a fuck i'm a teenager <laughs> like but always having I, I felt a similar like struggle of like you know my my sense of self-expression with fashion was so important to me and i constantly felt like reined in and constrained and like you know been told like no like you can't wear that or whatever and that for some reason i took it so personally I took it so hard so but also yeah like living in an environment where you know you're not in new york or somewhere where people wear all kinds of stuff like you know even small gestures can have a big impact and so i think that i've always felt a little bit of like a a, a kinderedness with cert with people who have that same kind of dilemma and including people like you know who are gender non-conforming or like like to express in a certain way that's that's not traditional because you know they're kind of treated the same way by a lot of people that i was at times like in a very conservative environment where it's like you know you can't do you like you can't wear that it's inappropriate like like that's bad whatever like even though i'm like i'm pretty straight like i I can relate to that aspect of, of a lot of people's experiences. And so I think that, yeah, there's, I've always had like a, a soft spot for, for that kind of like fashion need, I guess. And for like having the freedom, yeah, to, to wear things the way you want to and say what you want to about yourself. Yeah. I get that. Uh, how important that is. Yeah. Yeah. Cause once again, right. Fashion style, all that it's a spectrum when it comes to like sexual identity or gender identity and all yeah. these things and especially since something i used to always struggle with a lot was the fact that since i like to wear things that are a little bit more on the androgynous side or even like viewed as more feminine as opposed to classically masculine a lot of people would always ask me are you straight or are you gay or whatever i'm like <laughs> I i'm literally like just a heteronormative guy but it's just my own personal style that I like to embrace yeah. forever. Yeah, uh, a great but, example of how just like, you know, you can't really make assumptions in, with fashion. Yeah, yeah. but then it kind of like, eat, not really eats away at me, but it's always in the back of my head, or it was where I would like worry, but like, okay, are people gonna think I'm gay or are people gonna really think that I'm like a weirdo? That's a valid concern, you know? and because like there's even consequences to that sometimes, you know? Like, yeah, like yeah. dangerous, violent consequences. Yeah. Yes. And it's, so that's why like also saying like i'm very like supportive of just people like wanting to be able to fully express themselves in whatever way they want to be able to and for the runway show i walked in uh on saturday for diffa it's like a huge charity runway show for uh um aids research and stuff there was a lot of drag queens and it's just like really cool seeing everything that they're doing and uh i recently met a really amazing uh drag photographer named mark myers our mayors. I'm sorry if I'm mis mispronouncing your name, but really amazing stuff. And I love seeing people who are really able to just embrace the stuff that's almost a little counterculture in yeah. a way, which is kind of weird to say though, like, oh, I dress super counterculture, right? Even though the way you dress is just how you want to dress, right? Yeah. But in the context, it makes sense, you know, like yeah. the context of, of where you are and, and who you're surrounded by 
you know, it's something that seems subtle to someone could be very countercultural where you're at, you know. Yeah, and so at what point as like now a professional designer working in this industry, uh, where you're kinda like, Oh shit, I'm like I'm kinda good at what I do. Uh, there's plenty of days where I don't feel that. Um but I would say probably like it's, it's been since I've been in Dallas that, that I've done two runway shows in Dallas and somewhere in that in that realm is where I started thinking like okay I think I might be kind of good at this like yeah 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 I mean I think uh, I'm definitely a perfectionist with my work for the most part and so I've always been like dissatisfied with a lot of aspects of what I've made but I think seeing people seeing the way that I've felt supported and like seeing my work actually seem to mean something to people repeatedly has kind of made me think like okay like this is giving people something I want to continue to do that be better at it and yeah I'm seeing I'm seeing glimmers of it being good I mean when it's when when I when there's a piece that I like to wear then I feel like okay I'm I'm doing a good job yeah because it used to be that I'd wear stuff I'd make it there's just something wrong with it like doesn't fit right like something's proportions are off or something's sewn badly I was like you know I, I suck but I'm, I'm, my craft's getting better. My understanding of design is getting better. And right now my limitation is just, I've got to the point where like, I basically, I need a team to make my collections. Cause I just, you can't, you don't have the time as one person to really make a collection for a season. And yeah, I need, I, I need a business partner. I need investors. I need a team right now. And I've done, I've done my work to put in, you know, building my knowledge and my skill set to where I'm like, you know what? I am a good designer. I know that now. But I, I still have some limitations. Yeah. Yeah, I think having that team and having people support you and help you with all those other aspects of stuff like really matters a lot. Like one of yeah. my friends, Camden, she's actually, I don't know if she's announced this yet actually. Anyways, but she's been building a collection of like her own clothing items and stuff that she sews just out of thrifted like denim jeans or stuff like that, right? It's just like really cool stuff. But she's handling, like, all of the actual, like, designing, sewing, and all of that. But she needs, like, her best friends or other people to help with all the other aspects as well. Because yeah. it really is just a lot of time. person. I think it's interesting that you actually enjoy wearing your own clothing as well. Because I know not every fashion designer is like that. Like, I just recently interviewed uh, a good friend of mine, Abu Wen. And he has his own big, almost like streetwear basics type of line. So a lot of really good pieces that I personally love wearing and stuff. And I love the cuts, colors, all of that. But he never wears his own clothing. And he said he, what gives him the most joy is seeing other people love his stuff. I, I, I get that too, because, you know, I, I, I do wear some of my own stuff, but sometimes, like, you know, I'm just so invested. I, I'm too deep into it. Like, I just need space from it. And so I, off, off, I often wear very simple, just plain black you know, kind of like to me, it feels just very neutral. And I, I describe myself as like a, just a little shadow. Like, I just want to be a little shadow. And I do, but I design things that are fall, that fall outside of that. You know, I use more color than that. And it's different, different things. But yeah, I, I, I relate to that too, as well as to a certain degree, because I don't wear everything I make, you know, there's certain things that part of it might be like my relationship with my body, where like, I don't always like showing off certain certain aspects of my body but again like being a, a good designer i've got to be able to design for people who like you know want to show off their legs a little bit more or whatever and like so i make stuff that i maybe wouldn't necessarily be comfortable in but i really sure love and other people love it and to wear it i mean that that i relate to 100 percent. it was the best feelings the best part of it is seeing other people love what you do and then being able to use that like that's like the the greatest drug like it's amazing yeah especially yeah. when it's like a direct reflection of like knowledge just all your creativity but then like who you are as a creative person right and it's being like almost validated in a sense to where, like now yeah, like my work is actually reaching people well and it just makes me feel like you know it's i i'm not so obsessed with just like saying what i want to say like i also care about like giving people something that's useful and helpful to them you know so for me to see it being useful and to bring joy to someone else is like really important to me even if it's not you know, it's not that it's reflecting like my vision for the world all the time. It's it's also like, is that meaningful? Is it helping someone else to express what they need to express? You know, they, they, they're gonna wear it their own way. Like I'm not necessarily looking for fans who are just gonna like 
copy my runway look, put on my brand and be my brand. Like, you know, they're using that as an element in their own creative expression. So yeah, it's all about my vision all the time. Uh, yeah. I think it's interesting you say that. And then also how you said you like to just be like a little shadow. Yeah. You know, in the background and all of these things. And I like to look like a little shadow. It, do you feel like it's hard for you to be selfish? And you yeah. also want to just give to others. Sometimes, sometimes it's hard for you to be selfish, yeah. Yeah. Mm, so do you feel like that has ever been like a major limitation when it comes to you creating stuff? Probably. Yeah, I've probably, in the past, I've worried too much about what other people think. There was a lot of fear attached to that. Like, you know, again, kind of with my conservative background. I think it's come across in my personal life in certain ways where, you know, I've put up with things for too long or felt a loyalty to people. I'm not just talking about like, you know, exes or anything. I'm talking about even just like, you know, friend groups or whatever mm -hmm. that I just, you know, I'm so dedicated to, part of it's, you know, because that's where I find my sense of home, you know, that I'm just not really, I may be letting other things kind of, you know, not maybe not investing in, in myself the way I should or really honing in on what I should really be doing for myself and just kind of too dedicated. I, I don't think that's the case so much anymore. I'm pretty protective of, of that at this point. But yeah, I think my like conservative Christian kind of background like makes me associate, you know, being selfish as a very bad thing. And like, you know, I, I'm, uh, yeah, I probably hold myself back in some ways by kind of having too much propriety or something. Yeah. I don't think that's bad though. I don't, I, I think being straight up selfish is a little gross, but you got to be focused. You got to know what you need to, you're responsible to yourself as well. You know, it's not so much being selfish, it's being responsible to what you have that you're good at that you can then also give, you know, just take delight in and give people success. Yeah. I think I was talking about this in another podcast. I don't think I, or not podcast interview, but I don't think I've uploaded it yet, but just, I'm a, such a strong believer that there's also nothing wrong with being selfish to a certain degree either. It's like, you need to be selfish in order to do the things that yeah. are the most true to yourself, right? Yeah. And I, as somebody who also like, I'm very much like a giver and like, you know, growing up with like very just strict parents, right? I was always like, I couldn't have my own opinion about stuff. I had to constantly like try to appease them and then others and all of that stuff. Uh, even me, like a socially awkward kid grew up my whole life. Um, learning to like set those boundaries, not just like socially and stuff, but setting boundaries with myself and with what I want to make and like a worry less about like the response I will get, especially now with like YouTube content yeah. creation. It's very out there. Yeah. And then even like with modeling by itself, you know, yeah. cause it's one of those industries where it'll make you feel like absolute shit about yourself. You know? I know. Go back to body dysmorphia or like self image issues, you know, and I'm like, yeah. oh shit. Like I'm like 5'11", which isn't short but then it's also like it's the very bottom end of what most runway models can be right so like there's always that little voice in the back of my head that's like insecurity right i know all about that yeah and then other things like oh i feel like just super fat uh, compared to like other like <laughs> heroin chic models. it's so rude when it's like you know i know i that's the dilemma where you're like i feel fat and it's like that is so fucking rude like you know for people like us or really good shape like it's like well okay well you know if you're fat what am i like you know like yeah. uh, oh it's so toxic i hate that stuff i hate yeah. it yeah i mean it makes you worry about stuff like my eye wrinkles like i mean i did some modeling too but again i'm five six like i didn't really get in any modeling until i was in my 30s oh really yeah so just That's kind surprising. of it was by happenstance that even started and then i was like well shit this is like a dream i never thought i could have a, a hope of doing and but then you know you get into it and it's so like it's affirming in a certain way, but then you get like a lot of like very deep insecurities. You scrutinize all this stuff. Mm -hmm. All that stuff is it's so twisted. But modeling world is slightly improving yeah. these days. No. Yeah. And I think it's getting better as also people start to become more confident in themselves. Yeah. Because I was talking to a Sean, I forgot his last name, but he's a male model. He's been in the industry here in Dallas for the past like over a decade. Mm -hmm. Super successful. And he, uh, maybe, what's that talk? No, I'm going to been talking to I don't remember who it was anyways somebody and they're they asked me how I take criticism and like how I take like all these things about my own self-image and all of this stuff being a model and stuff yeah and I've kind of realized like I understand what where my market is I understand like how I look and like I know I'm not everybody's cup of tea when it comes to modeling when it comes to dating when it comes to friendships you know all of these things I wouldn't recognize that no and so I know like 
I can't appease everybody, yeah. you know? And so I think that's like been the biggest thing. And obviously also with like fashion stuff too, and content creation. And then also like in my head earlier, I was thinking like, you have such a crazy, just good face structure and stuff like that. I was like, I wonder if she's ever modeled before. I have, yes. I would like to do more too, but it's, it, it, you know, it's scary. Like, I, you know, I am aging. I see that happening to me and it's just, you know, it gets scary sometimes, but. Yeah, uh, but I mean, aging is doing it. It's a natural part of it. I know, but I'm just, you know, it's still, it's very jarring when you start to see it happening. I'm like, you know, there's a lot of feelings of like, whoa, I'm already here. Like I haven't, you know, I feel like I've failed at so many of my like, you know, expectations of where I'd be, what I'd be doing in my life at this point. But at the same time, it's, I mean, you know, it's always a moving target. So no matter what you achieve, you're always like feeling like, well, now I need to do this, you know? So I, I've had a, I've had a pretty cool life for sure. But mm -hmm. you know, it's just weird. It's just weird. You get older and you're like, well, then I have like, I like wrinkles. Oh, but I mean, I don't know. A aging is such a natural, just part of our life, right? It is. And it's so natural. Everyone, it happens to everyone, and the alternative is worse. Like, you know, like, yeah, but you're dead. <laughs> no, just being dead. Oh, okay. Well, Either you age you. or you're dead. Like, yeah, so going back to the whole. Check out, like. Yeah, body dysmorphia and just self image stuff. So, and then, of course, changing as you get older and all of these things. Do you feel like that there's been any sort of correlation between, I guess, how you've viewed yourself over time and then how the clothes and stuff you've created has changed? I'm sure, I'm sure. When I first started out designing, I made like the things I was wearing at the time, like, you know, t-shirts and hoodies. And, you know, more recently, I, I've learned how to make, you know, like tailored pieces basically, you know, button downs, like actual jackets and trousers, which I didn't really, you know, they're very traditional pieces, so everyone wears some version of that at some point. But but I think that that's also reflected like, you know, a sense of maturity, but also kind of a sense of elevation and seriousness. And it also is just very androgynous, I guess, the whole like, you know, tailored clothing, collars, jackets, things like that, which I probably didn't, really think of myself in that way until my 30s. Yeah, I went through like a pretty big life change and had the opportunity to like, just kind of like be fully self-expressive in a way that I realized that term started to get attached to and I was like, well, that makes sense. At the same time, there's a lot of elements that say the same. Like there's, there's certain colors I always come back to, you know, certain greens, sort of like, you know, aggressive, sickly greens and like very violent, you know, oranges or pinks for me, like, you know, a hot orange or a hot pink is, is a violent color, you know, pale, pale, pale greens, I don't know, stuff like that, bone and black, that's just super traditional, but yeah, and just that element of kind of ethereal, almost fairy tale qualities with something that is very dark and heavy. And I think that's always been in my work, just how that's been expressed has changed a bit, it's been shared, yeah. That's what you're saying, man. That you've always kind of had those like core elements yeah. to your work and it's stuff cool like that. It's cool to see that. I mean, it's cool when you look back. I'm like, wow, I did it. I mean, that, that's what I was trying to do. It's still there. Like, I still kind of like that was true to me in a certain way. You know? Yeah. yeah. There's other things that I'm like, ugh, kind of embarrassed. Oh no. Yeah. Yeah, and you get to kind of almost compare and contrast like the previous work with like similar current works. Yeah. yeah. And so sometimes I go back and I'm like, oh, that was, that was really fucking cool. Like. I should, I should pull that back. I should make something off of that. But, yeah. Ah, okay. So I guess thinking forward now, what can people kind of expect from you this, I guess, coming year and all of that? Well, this coming year, you know, my plans have changed where I'm, I'm going to be here in Dallas for a bit, at least maybe forever. I don't know. So right now I have a small teaser drop that's coming up sometime this summer, a little limited edition drop. That's going to basically be a teaser trailer for my for my next collection and show, which will happen in the fall. So oh, it's just going to be a very small drop. It'll be like very accessible pieces to purchase on my website. That's in, in process right now. The collection's in process, mostly mentally and with research. And, you know, I'm kind of assimilating my team to help help me like somehow get that thing into real life. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be presenting full collection in the fall. But again, I need, need a business partner, I need investors, 
yeah. resources because you know I gotta pay I, I gotta pay my bills and I do have day jobs and stuff like that so it's just like always a struggle to like you know how do I make this actually happen and but I, I have a concept I feel really strongly about so yeah yeah a drop coming up this summer collection coming up this fall yeah and yeah. just I guess quick side note I feel like one of the hardest things is like finding those like investors and partners and all that people and stuff because you gotta really just put yourself out there and really yeah. network and yeah. I feel like for me, I guess that's on been on the easier side because I just love talking and chatting with people, right? But that I know like for a little black shadow, that's hard to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and with a lot of other creatives too, like yeah. similar to you, right? Yeah, right. That's right. one of the hardest part, just putting yourself out there to even get your stuff seen by yeah. people that would really be impacted by it. Yeah, but so. I've been I've been working on it. You know, I've been putting on the shows and yeah. I'm putting myself out there at this point. I feel like I'm ready now for that. For a long time, I didn't push that because I was like, you know, I don't want to take other people's investment into me if I don't feel like I'm capable of doing right by it. And at mm -hmm. this point, let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm proud of you because that's like a really big step to take <laughs> mentally <laughs> for yourself. Yeah. You know, feel like you're worth other people's just like trust. And but I also know I need people with different skill sets than me. You know, I'm like, I can't do it all on my own. That's why I need a business partner, someone who understands certain aspects of that that I don't necessarily get. You know, that's, you've got to find the right partners that bring what they need to the table so you can be successful together. And so looking for the right people. Dumb. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And so where can people find your stuff and like Instagram, website? Yeah. Instagram, that. website, YouTube. Melissa Ann Taylor is Instagram. Shop MelissaTaylor.com website. I think it's dope designer Melissa Taylor on YouTube. You can just, you can Google. If you Google Melissa Taylor, fashion designer, Dallas, you'll find me. So yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so this much. Great conversation. It was great. Yeah. I feel like we could talk for hours, but yeah, yeah. it's great to meet you in person and really excited about to see what you're doing. And yeah, I, I always love connecting with people who are like talented and passionate. And so I'm really looking forward to see if you do. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. And if there's anything I can ever do to help too with like any of your stuff, if you ever need a model, I guess as well. Yeah. Thank you so much.